Good evening, everyone. This is Luke Grand from Practical Farmers of Iowa. Welcome to the noon Farminar. We're glad you can join us, part of our winter Farminar series, weekly learning with farmers as the experts. Uh, this is the first time we've done a noon Farminar, so thank you all for joining us in the middle of the day. And we will continue with Farminars each week through the end of February on Tuesday evenings at 7 p.m. Central Time until 8.30. A uh, couple things to get out of the way first. Please put the viewer count in the upper right corner. Please put the number of uh, folks watching this with you tonight so we can report accurately the folks that are using this service. As well as add your email address and a little bit about yourself in the, in the chat box on the left so that uh, Richard and all of us can learn about uh, who's who's attending this webinar. I wanted to spend a couple minutes to just uh, kind of frame this, this, this day in, in uh, in, in, in a couple of ways. Uh, the purpose, why are we here? Um, I, I think we're all here because we care about uh, seeing more uh, farms uh, across the country uh, that are profitable, that are ecologically sound, and, and community that support the community around them uh, to, to make a really strong uh, community network of farmers so that we can all be successful in the food production that uh, sustains us all. And uh, this is just a photo from one member uh, that we recently uh, uh, visited with and uh, kind of helps capture that experience, as well as a longtime member, Vic and Cindy Madsen, out in western Iowa. Members of Practical Farmers of Iowa have, have always, from the start, been very instrumental in shaping everything that we do and the way we, uh, the way we act and, and, uh, and treat others. So I'm really grateful to folks like uh, Vic and Cindy Madsen uh, in Audubon County, uh, who have always been there and supportive uh, of farmers and, and practical farmers of Iowa. We really care about uh, uh, farmers and then listening to their needs and, and helping them learn from other farmers because that's what they say they learn best. So thank you all for joining us. And we also, the other purpose of why we're here is uh, the next generation. We all care about ensuring that uh, generation after generation families can be earning good livings and uh, learning all, all the time from each other so they can have great lives and really strong businesses. This is our Winter Farm in our series lineup. Uh, we're right, kind of in the middle of our series now. And uh, again, do join us next Tuesday for another uh, new Farm in our Tuesday night, 7 to 8.30 p.m. All the rest on the screen on that series are at that Tuesday time slot in the evening. But if that's a bad time for you, you can watch the recordings. We have all the recordings online, including this one will be online shortly. And uh, that'll be at practicalfarmers.org slash farminar. Join Practical Farmers of Iowa. I encourage you to be a member of Practical Farmers of Iowa. You can add your input and actually help shape the discussion and uh, the programming you see Practical Farmers of Iowa do. We're very responsive to our members' needs, and we'd love to have you be one of our bosses. So do join Practical Farmers of Iowa. Click on that link on your screen and pay your annual membership fee. Ten percent of our members are not from the state of Iowa. So we, we have a very wide base of, uh, of interest, and we welcome anyone to be a member of Practical Farmers of Iowa, join at that link and keep up with us on Facebook. We just had one of our largest events ever. Uh, we, we have 630 registrants, but I actually got updated numbers today, 656 registrants uh, at our annual conference. Tons of walk-in registrants, over 200 walk-in registrants, and uh, including a 300-person potluck party on Friday night that was a huge success. So if you're ever interested in getting together with a bunch of farmers and friends of farmers, uh, I think our conference is one of the one of the greats out there, and we'd love to have you join us next year at PFI 14. The January 23rd to the 25th uh, dates are what we're, we're looking at right now. So mark your calendars for next next year to join us and meet a bunch of great farmers that want to uh, help you along your way. Also want to acknowledge some great uh, members and practical farmers of Iowa, Irene and Tom Franzen of Chickasaw County. They uh, gave their farm to Practical Farms of Iowa, announced it at the annual conference in front of uh, a packed lunchroom. And uh, they have a wonderful story about their legacy planning, which is which they share openly. Uh, so if you're thinking about your legacy, what you want that to look like, uh, Tom and Irene would be glad to share you their process and decision making and how they've been able to uh, secure access to the land uh, for, for generation after generation uh, with uh, the land being held by a nonprofit organization. Their son will have first right to, to, to rent, rent the land and as long as he wants to rent it. And it's a really great story. So thank you very much, Tom and Irene. Finally, if you're looking to get more experience, get paid on the job training, check out the Labor for Learning program. This is a new program offered by Practical Farmers of Iowa to help uh, beginning farmers get the experience they need 
to be successful farming. You know, we have got 10 trainers lined up for this year in Iowa, all different kinds of farms, uh, row crops, livestock, fruits and vegetables, um, and they all want to help share their knowledge. They also get great benefits beyond just the paid uh, job experience. Uh, one to two hours a week, in, uh, individual time talking about financing, talking about how the farm makes a profit, business planning details, as well as a great discount to our annual conference in 2014 and even a free lodging experience, uh, PFI member homestay. You get front of the line treatment for that option to be if you're a PFI trainee. So if you want more information about that, you can always contact me, Luke Gran, at Practical Farmers of Iowa, Luke at practicalfarmers.org. That's it, Richard, I'm gonna open up your slides and uh, we'll have you begin. And this is a really great topic about crop insurance. Let's see here. Is my microphone on, Luke? Yes, excellent. I'm just looking through the list here, and oops, let me just browse my computer real quick. Thought I'd updated it yesterday. Here we go. Richard Wild, here we go. I'm just going to take a minute to upload. You could begin with your introduction, perhaps, and uh, in a few minutes we'll see the slides appear on the screen. Thanks, Richard. Thank you, Luke. Is my microphone on? Everybody hear me? Great. Okay. Um, this is Richard DeWild, Harmony Valley Farm. Um, just finished my 40th year of organic vegetable farming. And let's see, it was our 20th year of CSA. So this last year was a anniversary year for us. So are we still waiting for those farm pictures, Luke? Yeah, it looks like it's about 26% of the way done. Um, maybe tell us about Captain Jack. Uh, Captain Jack is, let's see, I think he's going to be five years old uh, this spring. Um, Border Collie, really sweet dog. In fact, um, one of the only dogs that I've known that could be totally trusted around small children and even babies. He's a real sweetheart. Um, <clears throat> never misses a chance to go to the field, even though uh, because he sheds dog hair, he's not allowed to go into fields of vegetables, you know, food. He's not allowed to go into the packing shed, but he lives with us and, and uh, loves to ride in the truck and go and visit all the crews and everybody loves him. He's the official hospitality coordinator here. He will, you come and visit, he will meet you at the door, guaranteed. Seventy-five percent of the way loaded. Sorry about that delay, folks. See, my screen has uh, a picture on the right of myself, Jack, and my partner, Andrea Yoder. And without, um, well, both of them, but especially Andrea, it would things would be a lot different around here. She really does a super job of keeping things um, organized, running smoothly. And we're doing really good. I see quite okay, a any moment now. It should be okay. I'm so. just going to ask people just to uh, sign in, like who they are. Right. Yeah. It looks like a fo few folks have have put in the chat box with where they're they're coming from. If, if others want to participate and let us know where you, if you're a farmer or an or a employee for a different organization, let us know. Anybody from uh, FSA office here? Hey, there it is. Go ahead, Richard. Okay, it worked. 
Uh, just some pictures of our farm. Um, pretty uh, field of peppers from this summer. Uh, below that are this that's the box of vegetables that we're delivering this week our last um, CSA delivery for this past year uh, Dane County Farmers Market we attend something like 28 weeks um, from April through early November on Saturdays and below that is a picture of our farm from up on top of the hill we farm about 120 acres of organic vegetables in this Spring Creek Valley and then in the uh, Bad Axe River Valley for a couple miles both directions. Uh, we also on the hillsides graze uh, 18 Black Angus cows and as many as 30 pigs on pasture. Part of our crew, this was late fall, so of our crew of over 50 in the summertime, um, we had a, this crew in the fall, and now we're down to about 15 for the winter. Okay, to business. Um, I was going to give you a little overview of other insurance options besides NAP that I'm aware of, I'm not very knowledgeable about them, but I suggest that they're worth checking out. Um, evidently slightly different, AGR, Adjusted Gross Revenue, and AGR Light. The difference being, um, that the record keeping is much easier. Uh, it's based on tax, tax records, your last five years, which unfortunately, I believe, um, makes it unavailable for new farmers until you have, if you can survive your first five years, then you're eligible to uh, participate in this insurance. Doesn't make total sense to me. Um, AGR is not available if 35% of your expected income is from animals or animal products. Um, I believe that AGR Light has no limit on livestock, and I believe the limit of production is limited to a million dollars, which sounds like a lot, but the AGR Light Wizard is uh, <clears throat> would tell you more about these and also it, I believe it allows you to uh, do some tests from numbers that you would put in for your farm um, and would tell you what kind of premium you might expect to pay for what coverage and what kind of recovery you might get from a loss to, just to help you make um, a decision about whether to go with either one of those. The premiums are high from what I know, uh, but the potential for a payout is much higher than say the NAP program. Um, lower record keeping requirements, although when I checked out AgriLite, they started talking about subtracting any costs that we had beyond growing and harvesting a crop. So they wanted to see all of our, you know, packing shed records. I remember they wanted to subtract the plastic gloves that we use. Um, so if you were to go with either one of those, I would suggest that you get all of those little details clearly in writing. Uh, the agency we went to said that 
they would be willing to insure only our wholesale production, in other words, excluding our um, CSA. But that was a complication in record keeping that I, you know, I was a little less than confident that would work out. I should tell you a little bit more about our farm. About half of our production goes to uh, CSA. We pack about 1,000 CSA boxes per week for a 30-week season. And so the other half then is either directly to retail stores or to wholesale distributors and a little bit <clears throat> from that farmer's market. Okay, this next slide is, you'll see it's dated 08, was when I checked out AgriLite and they looked at our last five years of returns and they sent me this um, little, to, um, and I can't tell you exactly what this means, but coverage level 80%, so I would guess that and the coverage was up to, um, 702,000. So if we had losses of any kind, so that would include uh, the bottom fell out of prices where we plan to sell things. If it was below 80%, then for a mere $26,283 premium, they would make up that loss. Our, looking at our income from those years, even 07 and 08 were uh, flood years for us. We had a lot of loss, but our income didn't drop off enough to collect on this premium. So I decided that at least at that point, maybe it's changed. This is a <clears throat> taxpayer subsidized um, program and maybe it's gotten better. That's why I encourage you to check it out before, don't reject it because I did. The only other option that I'm aware of for specialty crops, you know, odd things, vegetables, anything that isn't a major commodity crop is with USDA and it's called NAP, which stands for Non-Insured Assistance Program. In other words, there's a long list of crops that are not commodity, so there is insurance, regular kind of insurance available like there is for you know, corn, soybeans, cotton, peanuts. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the premium is very low. I believe it's a maximum of $750 per county. If you happen to farm on a county line, you could get stuck paying that twice. Uh, but the payout, this would be called a, a catastrophic insurance. In other words, if you had a extreme loss, like a 100% hail loss, if everything worked, the maximum you'd ever see would be 27%. That is 55% of 50%. Maybe you'll understand it better as we go on. <coughs> Excuse me, I gotta take a drink of water here. A higher record keeping requirement, but we're gonna talk about that um, at more length here too. Records are good. These are just records that we were keeping before NAP and that really help us run our farm. And I'll show you those records. <coughs> See, I'm back up to this last slide. On that 27%, I did want to say that our experience with NAP claims um, since we started with NAP, I think in 2001 or 2002. Oh, that was the first year of NAP, 2001. 
uh, when we have gotten um, a payout for a claim, it's been more like four to six percent of our actual loss based on our prices and yields that we expected. So very low. So you have to examine for yourself carefully if you know that small amount of payout is worth the high record keeping requirement. This is a little payment that we got in for 2011. And we raise a wide variety of vegetables. We plant every week from as early as we can in April through uh, <clears throat> planting garlic in October. So we're very diversified. So our chance of having very large loss is is minimized somewhat by the fact that many of our crops, for instance, uh, arugula is planted weekly for, this year we planted 25 crops of arugula. And in 2011, I think we had a little two week period where we had five or seven inches of rain and battered a bunch of those tender greens. So important things to understand about NAP. Let's see. I have to remember how to grab that little arrow, Luke. Yeah. Just click on the screen anywhere you want the arrow to appear. OK, thank you for the reminder. Uh, cauliflower. The FH stands for fresh harvest as opposed to, say, processing, or which might be frozen. Um, and we don't have, we don't farm on shares with a landlord, so we get 100% of the share. We planted 1.35 acres. And this yield, I believe, is in carrot weight or 100 weight. So our yield from that was really 10,467 pounds. The uh, disaster level is 50%. I believe that's 50% of our approved yield called APH, which we'll talk about more later. And so this sheet is how they calculate whether we get a payment or not. And in this cauliflower case, we had, we had production, but it's less than disaster level. Um, why the net production is a little different, I can't tell you. Payment rate. That's $40 for 100 pounds or 40 cents a pound. How much cauliflower would you like to grow for 40 cents a pound? This is a major problem with NAP from my, in my eyes, is they don't have accurate prices. Uh, we'll talk more about payment factor. One is good. That means that whatever we come up with, we're going to get 100%. If this cauliflower had been so damaged that we said, oh, we're just going to chop it down and not harvest it, then it would be classified as unharvested. And instead of a one, it would read, I'm not sure what it is for cauliflower, but let's just say the unharvested factor for cauliflower is about 0.5. So that means that whatever payment we were due, we're only going to get 50% of it. And then we're only going to get 55% of that. So it comes down to calculated payment, $889 for more than an acre of cauliflower. Wow. Oh, it paid for the seed.
go down to uh, lettuce. Here's a little um, a little trick. This is uh, what is that golden rule? Uh, the government giveth and the government taketh away, right? So here under lettuce BTR, which is um, what does BTR stand for? It's our salad mix lettuce. Um, it's baby something. We earned uh, a damage payment of $512. But then this is crisp head lettuce, which we thought we were going to have a larger loss when we filed this. But as it turned out, we had over 50% of our normal production. And so they figured that out to be a minus number. And they group light crops together. So they added 512 and 169. And then our payment dropped to 343. Uh, this Whole payment, I believe, um, well, at one point totaled five thousand dollars for that little rainstorm, which is helpful. Average market prices. We're going to talk more about that. This is from the NAP handbook which you can actually access online. I believe it's 1,504 pages long. And I've spent time picking things out of there. This is right from the handbook. S, um, is my arrow still working? Whoop. No, my arrow doesn't work on this. There it is. Thank you, Luke. STC is the state, well, the state person that establishes prices. But it says in the book that shall establish average market prices that are reasonable when compared to local markets. I believe the state of Wisconsin, I'm told, uh, looks at prices um, at Chicago Terminal, our closest um, conventional produce terminal and establishes uh, prices from there. I don't think that all reflect uh, local markets, but I haven't made uh, huge gains on changing that. We do not sell to that terminal market. We. Um, that's a conventional market, and all our production is organic. There, are, There is some organic on that terminal, I'm sure. And it's supposed to be included in, this is AMS uh, prices that are reported by AMS. You can look on their websites. And I can't, maybe they report prices weekly. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, record keeping. Um, on this last price issue, which we will come back to here more, uh, Wisconsin says, you know, that's the easy only place we have to go to get prices because we don't know what you local guys are getting, even though um, this slide we're looking at now is our farm's annual yield by crop, which includes uh, total dollars and units are all pounds. So a very simple um, calculation. Oh, I did it down here for uh, beets. Uh, our total sales of beets divided by number of pounds, our average price, which more than half of those were wholesale, was $1.50 a pound. 
And I think we'll see that the um, Wisconsin crop table price is something like 43 cents a pound. We started keeping um, this kind of records for our farm going back to 1996. So before we ever were involved in NAP. And we do this for our own information. It really um, tells us something about, you notice this is the acres that we planted. The harvested acres might be a little different. See, without this arrow, you don't know what I'm talking about, yeah. Okay, um, units per acre. So for 2012, our, we're, we're going to use beets as an example, I guess. Um, our average, oh, there's, we grow three different kinds of beets, Kyosha gold and red. And the average uh, for all of those beets over the whole season was 11,773 pounds per acre. We had 11.7 .7 acres of beets. Average dollars per acre for that beet crop was 17,756, almost 57. So comparing crops, looking at, Chris, uh, high dollars per acre or any dollars per acre, you have, we have to look at our cost of production um, to see if it's really a profitable crop. But before we do a lot of wholesale crop, you know, we like seeing over a period of years, um, what kind of yields we can get per acre. And beets has looked good consistently through, you know, all those years and lots of different weather. And so we have, you know, increased our beet production as we had markets. And it's very important crop on this farm. So I'm telling you this because Keeping records is really a good thing for your farm. I'd hate to say, you know, keep records for a NAP program or keep records for organic certification. Keep records for good records for your farm and organic certification is a piece of cake because that's, this is the kind of records that they want to see and, and are reporting to um, FSA Farm Service Agency for the NAP program comes right off of this sheet. It's acres and pounds of production. So this kind of records are essential to participating in the NAP program. This is a spreadsheet that we developed with our local Vernon County um, FSA office where we report um, our crops and these crops in this abbreviation okay beets beets hybrid I'm going to show you the table that these came off of um, is right is from the FSA table. Our red beets go into hybrid category, and the golden kiosia OPN is open pollinated. But we have chosen chosen categories as um, ones that are as close as possible, and then the reason we put li this little note golden kiosia there is so we can be consistent about um, reporting in some cases you know it's it's varieties rock door is the yellow bean variety that we use so back to beets um, this was our total production in planting period two Oh, that's why it doesn't match that other sheet. It's in pounds. 
planted on this planting was 625 June 25th our field number 55.52 acres of red beets so we report every date that we plant which field it's on and how many acres and then later at the end of the year we fill in this production but the production is divided between uh, red beets planting period one and there's two planting periods for beets we're going to talk more about planting periods they are very important Let's see we talked a little bit about unharvested and prevented planting factors <coughs> I've never used prevented planting I don't think that multiplier number is very small um, and their reasoning is well you don't even have to put the seed in the ground the weather prevented you from even planting it uh, but I think it's worth um, worth doing because that can happen a prolonged say period of rain and our weekly planting we might miss a weekly planting of uh, our arugula greens FSA prices um, are supposed to be figured on a harvested here a harvested basis if you if you do not harvest them then that unharvested factor is going to apply in other words you didn't have the cost of paying a crew to harvest that crop so your payment is going to be less so my suggestion and our practice is we harvest something even if it's a small amount from any crop that we have a disaster claim on okay this slide is <clears throat> It says national crop table but it's this is really for Vernon County Wisconsin because things like planting periods are established for individual counties I've been told recently that um, this I means irrigated and is not irrigated um, prices are the same but this I don't quite understand but that you can only have planting periods if you have irrigation and they don't say that you have to have a center pivot irrigation but some uh, means of irrigating and I believe that has to do with for example if you had an extended dry period you would be uh, you wouldn't able be able to to keep on a, a scheduled planting whether it was weekly or so here here is the the county they've got a county average yield and then the price $915 a pound no this is per ton so I did the math on $915 for 2,000 pounds and come up with 46 cents per pound now remember a few slides back we said that our average yield in 2012 or price average price was what something like a dollar fifty a pound here's an unharvested factor if you said you didn't harvest it then any payment that you were due would get you'd really only get 42 percent of that so they're saying that the cost to harvest a crop of beets is 58 percent of their value I think that's high I think that's erroneous but don't even plant them and you get 32 percent that's it seems like a better deal for these 
I don't find these to be totally accurate, but they are what they are. You can appeal them. Here's the planning period. Let's see, is there a date? No, we'll look at, uh, we'll look at planting period dates in another slide. Application closing, that means that you would have had to applied to the NAP program for this crop by March 15th of 2012. See if there's anything else on here. I have some notes here that I haven't been looking at, so I'm going to Okay, in case I forget um when you're thinking about records to keep for the NAP program, uh, keeping a little journal of weather data is helpful because you need to, if you have a loss, to show what, um, what that was. And local weather service could be quite a bit different than your own on farm. So it just means for me, when I dump out the rain gauge, I go and write down date and amount of rain, make a little note about uh, average temperatures for the week. Because any losses for NAP are weather related. Weather can induce disease in crop and it can, actually, and can influence um, insects. So the damage might actually be, say, from disease, but you need to be able to tie it to weather events. Okay, this is the crop groups for the NAP program. And it is a lengthy list and it's very um, inclusive. I mean, they have, I won't say everything, but I think there's even oddities like Cardoon on this list. Globe artichoke. Look at cabbage. Uh, FH is fresh harvest. PR is processing. SD. I think seed. If you're in the business of raising seed, you could ensure it. There's many different kinds of cabbage. I don't know what choy is, some um, Chinese cabbage. Um, we put ours under either hybrid cabbage, we grow a little Napa cabbage, uh, and we have Savoy cabbage. Whatever ones you choose, we over the years we've decided to try to keep things as simple as possible. So the our red Savoy, for instance, goes into Savoy but we make note of that on our charts. So we do the same every year. Uh, pay crop, pay, pay type would come into play if you had a payment. Remember on the payment sheet, back a ways where they group those lettuces together. They're gonna group ones that have the same pay crop and pay type together. Usually that is to your disadvantage, but that's the rules. This little pet, pet peeve of mine, um, just to say that dates are very important, like the, the dates, and I'm going to show you a slide. Um, dates for reporting your acres, dates for sign up. Um, a lot of those, you miss it, you lose. Sometimes you can pay a late sign up fee 
if you're reporting uh, by email and you do it after 4.30 on the day that it was due and they didn't open the email, oh, they don't count your email anyway. They have to transfer it to their own sheet and you have to sign that for it to be considered timely filed. Unfortunately, I found out that FSA has many dates that they're supposed to follow that um, in Wisconsin, for instance, the crop table is supposed to be done 120 days before the sign up. I don't think 2012 is done yet. This shows some of the dates of um, application date. Most vegetables are March 15th, but we're still trying to figure out here, asparagus is 1120. Uh, strawberries, raspberries, 1120. Rhubarb is something like another part of this chart, um, August 20. I, I can't explain it, but you just have to, if you have those crops and want to sign up for them, uh, you have to, most things will be March 15th. There's a few uh, perennial crops that are other dates. Um, a question from a participant or a, um, about the weather data. FSA will send, an, I think it's called an adjuster, to our farm to verify that there was crop damage, but we still have to put um, and be able to show, you know, what caused that damage. So he wasn't there when the hail fell, in other words but he can see the result of it. Okay, a little more about planting periods, which I said are really essential to NAP uh, working. And A uh, question about uh, premium $750 maximum. Um, that is, no matter how many crops you sign up for, I think it's $750 per crop, but the maximum total premium is $750. So once you reach that maximum, keep signing up for crops, and it's still $750 per county. So in 2002, our, we turned in a damage claim for beets. And in that year, we had four or five crops of beets you know, planted starting in uh, early April. And maybe we plant every two or three weeks when one crop is up, has a couple small leaves, and we plant a second crop. So those first uh, four or five plantings did quite well, and we had, we'll say, normal production. And then in the fall, right around the 15th of July, we plant a much larger uh, crop for fall harvest and storage and selling, like even into winter. We're just now uh, selling out of beets. So we planted, in the year uh, 2001, we planted, we'll say a total of four acres in five plantings in the early part of the year. And then July 15th, we planted another four acres for fall harvest. So a total of eight acres. The 
production from the first four acres, we'll say, was 100%. The production from the, the four acres planted for fall was a total loss, so 1% um, production because we definitely had a little harvest, we'll say. But NAP is only going to pay if you have more than 50% loss. So you add 100% and 0%. And our loss, even though it was 100% for the half of that crop, they lumped them all together for the summer, and our loss was, you know, right at 50%. In other words, so no chance of payment for that year. So that's when I found out about planning periods. And once we had planning periods, we'll use that same example again. Um, so let me tell you what a planning period is. At first, it's a little daunting, but it's really easy. Um, we plant our first beets, we'll say the middle of April, the 15th of April. And beets take 60 days to maturity. You can take that right out of a seed catalog. Maybe you'll find a 52-day uh, but 60 days, nobody's going to argue with that. So April 15th, add 60 days, and you're now at the 15th of June. So let's see. Right here, beginning of harvest date is the final planting date for that Beats period, planting period one, the day that you harvest your first beets from your first planting, the April 15th planting, that's the end of that planting period, and this, the next day is the start of planting period two for beets. So then if you have a claim, it's going to be in either or maybe in both, but in my 2001 example, all of our production was planning period one. All of our disaster was planning period two. So if those planning periods would have been established, we would have gotten a substantial payment. Without the planning periods, we got zero. So how, <clears throat> how do you get planting periods? They're not, they're not automatic. The farmer has to ask for them. And I asked in 02 when I found out about this. And, but it wasn't until I ended up writing all the planning periods for our area of the state. I think they would apply for at least the whole half of Wisconsin and most of Iowa, that they would be, that we have a very similar climate. And we took these to our county committee. And after a bunch of um, back and forth, they did approve. They approved a small amount in 2005. And in 2007, we got a whole bunch more. There's still a little um, tweaking that needs to be done. For instance, the, remember the lengthy crop groups, um, they keep adding to those. So they recently they added scallop squash, which we do grow, and we were reporting it under another summer squash. And well, summer squash isn't on this page, but it has planting periods. But the sunburst scallop squash that appeared on the crop table will not have two planting periods until someone, i.e. me, um, formally requests it from first the county committee, has to approve it, and then it goes to the state committee. And then eventually, it'll show up on the crop table. Since that hasn't been done, we continue to report our scallop 
under another summer squash category. So beets, let's see if I did this right. Hybrid beets, um, if you plant them earlier than April 15th, maybe it's a gamble that you and I would take if the weather was really good. But it, they may not be eligible for insurance if they're planted unreasonably early. And then that planting period we call PP1 ends with June 15th and the next planting period starts June 16th and Vernon County says that the last reasonable date to plant beets is August 1st. I think that's a little bit late but by not more than a week. Baby beets late in the fall, they're frost tolerant. So this was established based on earliest maturing beets of 45 to 50 days. So since though that is in the seed catalog, nobody's going to argue with. And we'll talk more about the county committee later, but you might get an argument with them if they don't know very much about vegetables. You may need to be in a position to you know, sh show these dates and explain to them um, how some of these crops that they're not familiar with grow, whether they're frost tolerant or not. Is it, you know, <clears throat> you can't get April 15th um, as a planting, the first planting date for, say, tomatoes or peppers, unless you have very good frost protection. Chris says if the fee for sign up for NAP is 250 for crop, that might be true. But since we sign up for you know 50 some crops, then we have quickly reached the max, which just went up this year. It was 250 last year. Um, it maybe it's starting in 2013, which we've already signed up for because we sign up for strawberries and raspberries in November, and the the limit, the maximum, is now 750. And remember, planting periods are, you know, they're not for your farm, how you might plant things, but they're established for a county in a state. And it's my understanding that mm, Vernon County might be the only one in Wisconsin that has planting periods because farmers in other counties haven't asked for them. Okay, actual production history, which is the other big part of um, any kind of payment you'd get from NAP is based on prices that FSA sets, and I they say that they get those prices off the Chicago terminal, um, and they establish a county yield, but also it's best if you established your own actual production uh, history, APH, and it's, they take into account the last 10 years if you have records of production. If you don't have records because you're a new farmer or you say, I just haven't been keeping those records, then they, there are um, rules for them to assign yields for you, and those can actually uh, it can be good. It can actually give you a good start on um, a production history. I think if it's a new crop or your new farmer, you can get um, it may be 100% of 
the county expected yield, or it's called T yield. In some cases, like if you miss a year or have a disaster, see 07 was a onion disaster for us. So this yield was probably not, well, it, it ended up being our actual yield because our actual yield was higher than the T yield. Or what they would insert in here if our yield had been very low is 65% of the county average. So we are just, just above the county average. I think they have used our data in establishing those, to tell you the truth. Um, whoop, our approved yield went went down a little bit from the year before to for the year 20, this is for crop year 2012, any payment would be based on this approved yield. And that went down because oh, we had an actual yield that was lower than, or since they only use 10 years, sometimes it'll go down or up if you're into year number 11, then they're going to drop out the oldest year. And if that was real good production, then it can go down. But it's important to, you know, the better APH you have, the, the better payment that you can get in a disaster. So it's important to try to um, build a high approved yield. And so that means since if you report a disaster, then your yield is protected somewhat in that uh, you'll, at the very least, you'll get 65% of the county yield. If you don't report a disaster, you might get zero. So that would pull down your APH. So it sort of leads you to reported disaster, you have to report it within 15 days of the event. And you don't always know what the, sometimes crops like onions can come back from a weather beating and do quite well. But you don't know that necessarily at 15 days. So you might report um, a list of crops not knowing which ones will actually yield you a claim or or go above the 50%. I think this is my last topic, other than I hope there's more uh, questions. Oh, I'm going to go back to payment. Um, maybe even before we do this, I wanted to tell you that our record keeping for a year, averages about four hours a week. So if we, if we work uh, 50 weeks out of the year, four hours a week is just um, putting together that production and acres spreadsheet. If we hired somebody for $15 an hour, I believe that's $3,000 worth of record keeping. I think the record keeping is worth it just way more than that, just for how it helps us pick and choose um, profitable crops to grow. If you're doing it just for the NAP program and remember our payment for that I showed you um, earlier, only totaled five thousand dollars, and if you spent three or even four thousand dollars with a record keeping, you go, eh, why bother? Oh, I also paid seven hundred fifty dollars to sign up. Um, but it's the truth about NAP; it's not a real good program. 
and mainly because of the very low prices they're using and quite a few other little places you can go wrong like being late making reports or get caught with an unharvested factor um, but since the records are worth keeping anyway you're going to spend a little bit of time communicating with FSA we do it mainly um, by email but with an occasional trip to their office um, we have been over all those years blessed with um, office staff in Vernon County who are um, quite good people to work with they have become over the years knowledgeable about the program NAP is a quite complicated program and you may go into your county office and not be greeted with um, with a great deal of enthusiasm if if your application for NAP forces them to go down that long road of learning about it and which they maybe have not done before because nobody signed up for it then they may try to discourage you I've heard stories like oh you'll have to pay you know $250 for every single crop you sign up in other words they didn't know about the the maximum limit so there's county staff and then if there's everything gets approved by a county committee which is basically farmers in the county elected by farmers in the county to serve on this committee I think they get modest pay for the time they spend there um, but they may know little or nothing about growing vegetables and I've so sometimes it's been helpful to just go to a committee meeting get on their schedule and sit down and talk knowledgeably with them um, about like for instance planning periods and you know with the exception of a couple of committee members that were very prejudiced against organic production thought we were just farming the government um, we've gotten along pretty well with our local county committee it changes because it's you know they're elected for a few years if they fail to um, you know do what needs to be done in other words if you go and look in the NAP handbook and find things that uh, there's there's any number of processes to appeal a decision that they might make the first would be appeal to the county committee and if that fails you can appeal there's a state committee and I've done all of these the state committee was less rewarding than a county committee most of the committee members fell asleep during my presentation but they ended up waking up and giving me half of what I asked for so it was again it's it was worth um, worth the effort um, I did a NAD appeal that's national hmm NAD national I should know what that stands for I'll think of it anyway it's a process that's in place first you have to appeal to uh, a regional NAD judge yeah national appeals division and the regional NAD appeal is in front of a a NAD judge it's fairly informal sit down with um, in my case with several different FSA officials and we present our case and then he comes back some days or weeks later uh, with a full recording of the whole proceeding and makes a decision uh, well I didn't like his decision so 
I appealed to the national NAD, to the director of NAD, and actually got a favorable um, opinion, which went to the state of Wisconsin, and they didn't do anything about it. So did I win? Yes and no, because there doesn't there doesn't appear to be much of a of an enforcement. There's supposed to be an agency that makes sure that government officials, including Farm Service Agency, um, does their job properly. But it didn't work for me. It's never. They were told to refigure a damage claim. Our 07 uh, flood disaster, but that's quite a few years later and they haven't done anything. That is most of my experience. Um, does anybody have any questions? We have a couple questions coming, but a couple more things I could say. <clears throat> I mean, I hope, I hope um, that um, the reality of our experience with NAP has come through. Is that um, when we look at a loss based on our dollars and and our pounds, um, it's not a very good payment. But on the other hand, for that bookkeeping that mostly we would do for our own farm anyway, and a $750 sign up, we have gotten uh, checks for, you know, $30,000, $40,000 for um, a disaster. So that is definitely worth doing. Yes, we lost, um, you know, $200,000 worth of crops, but uh, and there are worse flood. I think we actually got um, 30. First, we got 35,000 from NAP. Oh, here's something. Um, there have been in the past other uh, disaster programs that were kind of voted on by Congress based on specific um, county or statewide disasters. The last one was uh, the SURE program, which I believe expired in September of 2011. But for many years, when, like the two years of flooding we had, Vernon County, the county you're in or an adjacent county, if, if it's declared a disaster, then the SURE program would kick in, but only if you had insurance of some kind and so if, if you have NAP insurance, then we had got a fairly modest NAP check. And then one full year later, surprise, surprise, we got um, a much larger check for from the SURE program. So there may be other opportunities like that. We don't know until we have another farm bill. But you can't be a, uh, you're not eligible for any disaster programs unless you have some insurance. Okay, so now we have some questions here. Yeah, just about the working of the NAP program. Um, pricing is the very biggest thing that right within the wording of that 1500 page document um, like I showed you the one about um, that prices should represent the prices of farmers in your county in other words local farmers actually get that's not that too hard to come up with that data we had um, 
a person at uh, Wisconsin Department of Agriculture that did a little survey of all the farmers that she knew in our area and put them on a spreadsheet and gave it to FSA and said, here, here's the prices, the local prices that you should be using, uh, which I think they promptly uh, threw in the wastebasket, but if they were to use, you know, real prices, then it would be a, a way different program. And I think it could be done. If, if somebody figures out how to get FSA to follow their own manual, then uh, that would be a huge help. Remember we said planning periods are very essential so that your a period of uh, disaster isn't balanced out, wiped out by another part of the summer that where you had good production. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a there's a uh, a reference in the handbook that there's several references to the local prices, but it also says that um, I'm not sure I can quote this exactly, but that the uh, there are nationwide prices. Um, let's see, what's AMS Marketing Service? Agricultural Marketing Service collects, and there's a couple others. They are, have been for some years, um, I believe it's Risk Management Agency through AMS has been collecting organic prices. And they're saying, well, someday, you know, there'll be a organic NAT price. Uh, they've been collecting them long enough. I mean, they're out there. Um, if that would happen, that would be another another uh, big improvement. A uh, question about CSA, and, and that's why we're still in business and thriving, is that, remember I said half of our um, vegetables that we grow, our production, goes to our CSA members, where so they, even though in the worst flood disasters we had, um, our members got a box every week. Um, there were some things totally missing from the uh, 07, but we had other crops on higher ground that survived, the things we planted later. Um, so essentially, they helped cover a lot of our our loss. Wholesale, um, wholesale buyers are, you know, may be sympathetic with your loss, but they're not going to uh, pay you for a crop that you don't deliver. Okay, maybe we have one more question from Carl. Richard, there's a lot of beginning farmers out there that uh, are wondering, you know, when's the right time to pull the trigger on 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 looking at a NAP insurance uh, product? So what would you say to to that audience? Um, I I wouldn't wait. It takes a while to learn the program and get the system down, and and to build your APH. And there's the the NAP provisions for inserting um, a production number for new farmers is not that bad. So you're really going to start getting a production history even though you might be a new farmer and not have any. 
it's going to take a while to get planning periods established in a county. Um, so I wouldn't wait. I would sign up, with plenty of time to sign up for the next year, March 15th. Do you think there's a certain size of production that, um, you know, below a certain number of acres don't bother or above a certain number of acres absolutely do this or that? No. I mean, I would say try to insulate your farm as much as possible by being diverse, having crops that, you know, in short season crops, um, have a CSA is a great insurance, but there's great opportunities, growing opportunities in the wholesale market, and, and that's more where, you know, even though NAP payment is quite small, every little bit helps. And so I would, I would say do it. You should be keeping the records anyway, so for a modest fee and a modest amount of time uh, you can participate in the program. You won't get rich probably with any insurance program, but it, it does help when, when you have losses. If it just, you know, pays your out of pocket, you know, your seed costs and growing your plants, you know, that helps. Any other questions? What do you think about that? Go ahead. Yeah, what do you, did you answer Sally Worley's question about uh, AGR light? No, maybe it's because my screen went blank. Oh, there. <laughs> I went to sleep. Um, Sally, I, I really should um, go and look at AGR light again, other than, you know, looking, we've been through some pretty horrendous disasters here, and having paid those large premiums over all those years and then, you know, collecting little or nothing in a disaster year, um, I don't think we'll do it. Unless it's changed since I looked at it in 08. Somebody let me know when you check it out. I, I know people that have paid the premium and signed up for it and said they sleep better at night and are kind of advocates of the program. Well, as far as, <laughs> you know, if you look at what, what I know about commodity crops like corn, um, they have unbelievable insurance options. Unfortunately, with, you know, like 90% insurance in Vernon County, we've got farmers, you know, clearing the trees off of hillsides that are so steep that they really don't ever plan to take a combine up there, but they plant corn, insure it for 90%, and make money off the insurance. And the land might wash down into the gully. I mean, that's, that's abuse of insurance. But why, and that seems to be the way the, the world of farm programs is going, is they don't want any more disaster, uh, ad hoc disaster programs. They want to just let the taxpayers subsidize to a high degree um, insurance company programs. Why can't we have, and, and that's what AgriLite is supposed to be. But I think with the amount of uh, taxpayer subsidy they're getting that they could do a lot better for specialty crops. Very good. Richard, I 
And unless there's other questions, uh, maybe Chris has a question coming up here. I just wanted to thank you for spending your, your midday with us and, and working on such a wonderful presentation. And man, it's, it's really incredible when you, when you said 40 years experience uh, growing vegetables. That is quite valuable to, to, to other folks who are maybe a little bit less uh, experienced. Luke, did I say that um, I would, if somebody is uh, going to the FSA office, signing up for NAP, and needs to establish planting periods, um, as long as it's similar climate to ours, I would be happy to email the whole list of planting periods that we have for them. Excellent. It'll save them a lot of work. Excellent. We will pass that along, and, and yeah, if, if you wanted to share it with Practical Farms Viable, we could keep it on file here too, and, and when folks uh, came to us, we could uh, let them know. Good idea. We also, go ahead. That's a good idea. I will send it to you first. I, I want to, I need to tweak it a little bit anyway. There's a couple recent changes. Excellent. We also uh, are helping to connect folks to opportunities in the conservation um, conservation uh, what is it districts conservation districts of Iowa, uh, and we also have some PFI members in the state FSA office um, committees. So we could help through our network potentially spread this around um, in Iowa at least. Great. Yeah, we really enjoy working with our uh, local. NRCS office. They have some great programs. We've done some really fun stuff with habitat. You know, fixing stream banks is kind of an expensive proposition, but um, they have some good programs for things that we like doing on our farm anyway, and they're basically, you know, making it much easier to do like uh, expensive prairie seeds, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, I wanted to take a minute and thank our funders. Um, I'm just going to switch views here real quick. The Beginning Farmer Rancher Development Program, the USDA grant uh, we got for three years of doing farm in ours has been really helpful in establishing this series, as well as uh, the funders listed here on the right, uh, especially the Crop Blocks Program, the Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship, Cedar Tree Foundation, Ag Ventures Alliance, John Deere, even Cliff Bar threw in some funds uh, for expanding this series, a couple more farm in ours, uh, this year. So what a great group of folks to help us uh, do this and thank you very much all for participating. Join us next Tuesday for a new farm in our high tunnel economics. How to grow not just great crops earlier and later, but grow some profits as well for your farm. Join us 7 p.m. Tuesday night for that farm in our and every week through February we will have these wonderful farmers sharing their knowledge.